Well, it just goes to show you can't believe a thing a vice chancellor says. <laughs> and George, don't worry, you'll never become chancellor after that. <laughs> There's no hope. And for you, of course, you've had your fill of, you will have had your fill this weekend of chancellors, vice chancellors, former chancellors. Um, so uh, I apologize for that, but it's a, it's a wonderful job. The pay is extraordinary. Uh, <laughs> the people you meet are uh, fascinating. And uh, every year you get to meet a better and better graduating class. So uh, if any of you are wondering what to do with your life, I could suggest you apply for the job of chancellor somewhere. <laughs> and uh, not that there will be of any vacancy here at King's with Kevin Lynch, of course. He's planning to settle in for the long term. And we were very lucky indeed to attract somebody of Kevin's caliber and, and, uh, and uh, devotion uh, as Chancellor of King's. Now, uh, George has made reference to the somewhat rocky start I had in my educational career, which continued throughout, I might add. Uh, having started at, as he said, he was right on this one, the Halifax Ladies College. And uh, according to my mother, uh, my first act of disobedience was to cut off one of the pigtails of the girl sitting in front of me, for which I suffered the dreadful punishment of not being able to attend cutting out class for a whole week. Well, so upset was I that uh, I accepted a junior role in the Christmas pageant as the second hump on the camel uh, <laughs> to absolutely rave reviews, I'd say. But like so many other things, that career went downhill slowly thereafter. In any event, uh, I do uh, want you to know how much I have enjoyed my association with Kings and enjoyed uh, the uh, role of Chancellor and how relieved I am that I can speak in English tonight and not Latin. Uh, I did take grade 13 Latin uh, in Ontario, and, but it was all about Caesar marching to a river and pitching a tent, which I didn't find particularly useful here at King's and in Encina. Uh, but uh, Kevin, I'm told, is a very apt pupil, and you will be able to judge his extraordinary abilities tomorrow when he talks to you in his fluent Latin. Um, Listen, I, uh, I want to address my few remarks, and I promise they will be few, to, to the graduates. Um, every insignia, I've got to tell you, I, I have stood in awe at the accomplishments of the graduates of King's. Um, and you know, given the many distractions and hurdles that you've got to get over when pursuing uh, a degree in higher education, it's no small feat, it really isn't a small feat, to obtain a degree uh, from as distinguished a university as King's. It requires intelligence, requires dedication, and perseverance on your part. But it also requires, of course, the support of your family and friends whose sacrifice and encouragement should not go unrecognized. Now, the important characteristics of any address are to be brief and to be relevant. I can promise you brevity, because I'm dying to know how the Habs are doing against Boston today. <laughs> Go Habs, go. I imagine it's not a unanimous. Ah, oh, good, I got it. Hopefully relevance, but that's for you to judge. But certainly as you pursue your various career paths, you'll face challenging economic times in a fractious, divided world. On the other hand, you've been provided, thanks to Kings, with a great opportunity. An opportunity to pursue your careers but also the opportunity to contribute beyond your careers, or perhaps with your careers, to the betterment of the society in which we live. The education you have, the people you know, the people who you will come to know, will all help you uh, provide that opportunity. My particular background is in law and politics, two professions that are not always at the top of everybody's head parade, particularly not politics. But contrary to many these days, I view politics as a public service and as a high calling. And for me, the foundation of public service is respect for the Constitution and loyalty to one's colleagues. And certainly when times get tough, 
due process and loyalty are doubly important. And with a few notable exceptions, neither concept has been much on display recently. So not surprisingly, people are wondering why our political leaders and what they do seem to be so disconnected, so disconnected from the concerns of Canadians, and why do the issues that are debated in our legislatures seem so distant from the real challenges faced by Canadians in their day-to-day -day lives? Where, one might ask, is the leadership? Where are the big ideas to move society forward? As one enters the center block in the Parliament buildings in Ottawa, carved at the base of the Peace Tower, is a sentence from the book of Proverbs, where there is no vision, the people perish. Therefore, one could ask, one could also ask, where's the vision? There are such great opportunities for leadership and vision in this country. Dealing with our environment, climate change, and balancing that need with the need to develop and transport our natural resources to global markets in the safest possible manner to identify just a couple. But these comments about the need for respect, loyalty, leadership, big ideas and vision apply to more than just politics. You don't have to be a politician to address the issues of the day. So the challenge I put to you is to build on the opportunity you've been given and be that leader. Develop the big ideas and create the vision that will serve you and this country as you discover a pathway to your future. Your professors and this university have provided you with the tools, those of a first-class liberal education, which in my view, and I don't think I'm alone in this, best prepares us for our lives as human beings and citizens. Dr. Donald Markwell, a noted Australian scholar in the fields of economics, education, and public policy, pointed out an address delivered at Trent University in 2010, and I quote, Contrary to some stereotypes, liberal education is not only or primarily about courses on great books or only classics and history and other humanities. Modern liberal education at its fullest typically includes courses in the life and physical sciences, social sciences, history, or other humanities. Some study that relates to values and moral reasoning, some language, and so on. It will also typically include a strong emphasis on communication, and most especially on writing. Liberal education will also be accompanied by a focus on extracurricular activities uh, as part of the students' all-around education. He went on to say liberal education does not mean that one does not get a specialized or vocational education at some point. Clearly very many people need that. But the argument for liberal education is that it should precede, or at, least at, the, or at the very least accompany, more specialized or vocational education so that our graduates have breadth as well as whatever depth they get. And finally, he said this. Various events of the last decade have highlighted the need for a broader education if one is to be able to fully engage in the world as it is becoming. For example, the terrorist attacks of September 2001 and subsequent events have highlighted the importance of understanding world religions and cultural diversity if current international conflicts are to be understood. Some of the corporate collapses of the last decade, such as Enron, have highlighted the importance of education in ethics or values. And the global financial crisis has highlighted the need for a greater understanding of economic uh, history and of a broader understanding of economic theory and policy. So with the skills you've developed here at King's, you had the opportunity, the opportunity to be a visionary, to lead, to think, to be creative in whatever area you choose to be engaged. It was the actor and producer Alan Alda who said, have the nerve, have the nerve to go into unexplored territory. Be brave enough to live life creatively. The creative is the place where no one else has ever been. You have to leave the city of your comfort and go into the wilderness of your intuition.
real challenge for you is to get down out of the bleachers and onto the field and just do it. Get out there into the world and become engaged. And I really mean that. You can't fully realize or utilize, I should say, the opportunity you have just sitting in front of a laptop, a cell phone, or an iPad. I think we all must take time, must make time, to meet one another and speak face to face. I urge you, whenever possible, to engage with each other in the very traditional way, in person. Your life should be a journey towards a destination, a destination where success is measured by what you have contributed positively to society. Contributing in the realm of public service, in support of your community, the arts, the sciences, and your country. And lest anybody tell you that it can't be done, keep in mind the words of Eleanor Roosevelt, who said, surely in the light of history, it is more intelligent to hope rather than to fear, to try rather than to not try. For one thing we know beyond all doubt, Nothing has ever been achieved by the person who says it can't be done. So I wish you well. I hope you use the opportunity you've been given, accept the challenge, and use your talents, which are considerable, in the service of your chosen field. But more importantly, perhaps, in the service of others. And finally, echoing Bob Mann's charge to you, keep a little place in your heart for kings as you go forward. Thanks.